Well, good evening, brothers and sisters. Um, last week we looked at the timeline concerning the kings of um, Cyrus. Then we looked at Cambasus, and then we looked at Smudo Surdus, and then Doris Hestespis. And then we looked at Exersus, commonly known as Ahasuerus. And then after that, we considered Artaxerxes. And we looked at how the prophets of Haggai and Zechariah are contemporary with the book of Ezra. And tonight we follow on with this fascinating story and see just how exciting the Word of God actually is. And we see just how powerful the Word of God is and how accurate the Word of God is and how it is something that we can rely on in our everyday life. And so what we do is we pick up the story for this evening's study but the prophet Jeremiah, in chapter 25, at verses 8 to 12, and where the dots saw I've just shortened the, the chapter. Because you have not heard my words, behold, I will send and take all the families of the north, saith Yahweh, and Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, my servant, will bring them against this land and will utterly destroy them and make them an astonishment and an hissing and perpetual desolations. Moreover, I will take from them the voice of mirth and the voice of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride, the sound of the millstones and the light of the candle. And this whole land shall be a desolation and an astonishment. And these nations shall serve the king of Babylon 70 years. And after it, after that, when that 70 years are accomplished, that I will punish the king of Babylon, saith Yahweh, for their iniquity. And as you can see on the screen there from the animations that I've put up, it was a warning by Jeremiah that there was going to be a punishment coming upon the people. And that punishment was as a result of the direct violation of God's law and the absolute refusal to bow to the will and command of the Heavenly Father, the Creator of Heaven and Earth. And that started in BC 606. But as God is just and God is merciful and God is full of compassion and long suffering, He said that after seven years of desolation, that He was going to bring again the accomplishment or the release. And that he was going to punish the king of Babylon for their iniquity. And so, this evening, what I'd like to do is consider the glory of God in the aspect of just the reason that God does the things he does and whether it is for our detriment or whether it is for our good. You know, when we think of the building, when we think of building, if I just say building within the Word of God, instinctively our mind goes to either Ezra with the building of the altar and then the temple, or we immediately shoot through to Nehemiah with the building of the walls. But we'll see that there's another aspect to this building. And we'll see that tonight, just how beautiful God's Word he set forth for us that we in his last days may have hope and that we in his last days may be encouraged to hold fast to the truth as we await the return of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so it is, as God said through Jeremiah the prophet that there was going to be this disbursement, that he says in Jeremiah chapter 33, Thus saith Yahweh, again, now, it's a conjunctive word. It means ultimately. There shall be heard in this place, which ye say 
shall be desolate without man and without beast, even in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem that are desolate, without man and without inhabitant and without beast, the voice of joy and the voice of gladness and the voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride and the voice of them that shall say, Praise Yahweh of armies, for Yahweh is good in his mercy and endureth forever. You see, that is the hope that we have. It is God's mercy. There is no other solution that man can give other than Yahweh himself. And it continues on. For I will cause to return the captivity of the land as at the first, saith Yahweh. So from these two chapters, we've pretty much seen that God declared that at the time, because of the unrighteousness of the people and because of their wickedness, he was going to take them. Even though he had raised up prophets, sending them early, pleading with them, they would not listen to his voice. And so he predicted and, and uh, um, prophesied that he was going to bring the country of the north, the king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, who would take them away and take them into exile. But with the same token, he was saying that after 70 years, I will bring you back again into your land. So within those two quotes, we're going to see an amazing, absolutely amazing theme that runs through all the way through to Ezra, through Nehemiah, and into Esther. You see, when Daniel, when Daniel was in Babylon, and we read of this, it was in the first year of Darius, son of Ahasuerus, don't worry about that Ahasuerus as being related to Exorcus. It's a different Ahasuerus in the timeline. Of the seed of the Medes, the Medes, which was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans. In the first year of the reign, I, Daniel, understood by books the number of years whereof the word of Yahweh came to, Jer to Jeremiah, the prophet that he would accompany 70 years in the desolation of Jerusalem. And I set my face unto Yahweh Elohim to seek by prayer and by supplications with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. You know, sometimes we can skip over that because we don't actually appreciate the absolute intensity that Daniel was actually going through when he was praying. You see, Daniel knew about the prophet of Jeremiah. He knew about the prophet uh, Isaiah. He knew about the prophecies. And he knew about the 70 years. And he knew that the time had come for his people to return. And so it is in verse 21. It says, Yea, whilst I was speaking, an immediate response from God. Because he sends his angel. Even the man Gabriel, who I had seen in a vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, touched me about the time of the evening oblation, or the offering. And he informed me and talked with me and said, O oh Daniel, I am come forth to show you skill and understanding. And come to show thee, for thou art greatly beloved. Therefore understand the matter. And consider the vision. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people. And upon thy holy city. To finish the transgression. To finish the punishment. And to make an end of sins. It's an interesting word, that word end. Not kata, you see it as a complete termination. It's the word seal. When you seal something, you can seal it, but you can also take the seal off. So it's reciprocating. It means that God has put there 
He's put a seal on it. He's ending that. But it's conditional. It's not one way. It's a reciprocating word. And it's to make reconciliation for iniquity. You know, in James chapter 5, it says at verse 16, it says this. Confess your sins one to another and pray one for another that ye may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. And that's exactly what Daniel was doing. He was praying in sackcloth and ashes, praying for the deliverance of his people. And it wasn't five minutes, ten minutes, or an hour or a week later. The response from God was instantaneous. That is how beloved Daniel was in the eyes of God. So we come to the 70 years. And we take a look once again at Jeremiah. And this is when he is speaking to, in the temple, he's speaking to the priests, and he's speaking to the false prophets. And whilst he's speaking to them, they are a little bit perplexed about why this man is bringing this judgment upon this beautiful house, because God has said in his word, his choicest place is Zion. And they plan to get rid of him. And they thought, well, if they can accuse him of blasphemy, then he'd be put to death. And so they managed to get the princes on their side. Because why? Because Jeremiah says, why has, they say to him, why has thou prophesied in the name of Yahweh, saying, this house shall, this house shall be like Shiloh. Remember what happened to Shiloh? It was a desolation. And this city shall be desolate, desolate without an inhabitant. And all the people were gathered against Jerusalem in the house of Yahweh. Basically, he told them this temple is going to be destroyed. And they were angry with them. And they got the princes involved. And they thought, this is our opportunity. But they weren't successful. And we know the temple was destroyed at the end of Nebuchadnezzar's siege in Jerusalem, 589, actually 586 BC. And it was finally rebuilt and dedicated by Zerubbabel in 516. That gives it exactly 70 years that it took place. So that was fulfilled. And in Malachi, which you may or may not know, is partly contemporary with Ezra. And he says this, A son honoreth his father, and a servant his master. If then I be a father, where is my honor? And that word honor is my reputation, my glory. My splendor. And if I be a master, where is my fear? Where is my reverence? You come into my house. You bring me abominable alt uh, altar offerings. And you expect me to accept them. Where is my fear, saith Yahweh of armies, unto you, O priest, that despise my name? And you say, Wherein have we despised your name? It's interesting because that time frame there, the actual ministry of Malachi is between 500 and 460 BC. So it's almost contemporary with when Ezra goes back to, uh, um, goes back to um, Jerusalem and he finds those priests and people Marrying foreign wives. And so you can see there, that was the timeline that we looked at last week. And we can see that's exactly where Malachi would sit. And the temple was destroyed in 586. 
And it was well, it 516. It was dedicated by Zerubbabel. 70 years exact. And I just want to fill in a little few details on the Sabbath. Because in Leviticus 26, verse 32 to 35, it says this. And you will get, you'll start seeing the theme as we go through this. I will bring the land into desolation. You see, it's always got this. This is about punishment. And your enemies which dwell therein shall be astonished. And that word astonished is the word horrified of this atrocious event. They can't believe this has happened to this place. They're going to be astonished at it. And I will scatter you among the heathen and will draw out a sword after you and your land shall be desolate and your cities waste. Then, then, and only then. That is the, <laughs> the turning point. Yahweh says, Then shall the land enjoy her Sabbaths, as long as it lieth desolate, and ye be in your enemy's land. Even then shall the land rest, and enjoy her Sabbath, as long as it lieth desolate it shall rest. Because it did not rest in your Sabbaths when you dwelt upon it. You see, so long as the inhabitants were in the land, they were polluting it. God said that you must have no idols. None of them. No graven images. I don't want you to have any false gods. I don't want you worshipping Baal. Not at all. Your land must have a time of rest. Because it's a principle that I've given you that on six days I created the heavens and the earth and on the seventh day I rest. It is your faith in me that I am the creator of heaven and earth. And that I, in all my power, that you should reverence me. Because my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. And my ways are higher than your ways. And you need to trust in me and have faith in me that I can deliver no matter what happens. Because I am Yahweh. I am God. You know the interesting thing about this. It wasn't long before that Sabbath day became just another day. Because they felt that that's a day we waste in production. And that's why Yahweh is saying there, I'm going to take you out of this land and I'm going to send you away. And only when you are taken out of there is my land going to rest. And when you're out of there with all your pollution and all your idols and all your filth, the land will heal itself without you. But when you're gone, and only when you're gone, will the land have the opportunity to recover. For I am Yahweh your God. Ye shall keep my Sabbaths and reverence. There's that word again. Fear. Not the fear that you're thinking. It's a reverential fear. My sanctuary. I am Yahweh. He says in Leviticus 26 verse 18. And if you will not, yet for all this, hearken unto me, then I will punish you seven times more for your sins. And at the end of every seven years, in the solemnity of the year of release, in the Feast of Tabernacles, when all Israel is come to appear before Yahweh thy God, in a place which he shall choose, thou shalt read the law. You'll see just how beautiful this fits in with the story of Ezra. It's quite astounding. Look what he says about the Sabbath. Six years thou shalt sow thy field, 
and six years thou shalt prune thy vineyard, and gather in the fruit thereof. But in the seventh year shall be a Sabbath of rest unto the land. That's three years. They planted for six years. And after the sixth year, God produced enough produce for three years. One for the, la the year of rest. One for the year of when they were actually starting to plant. And enough for the next year while the produce was still growing and all having to. That's what God said. And God said, that is what you were getting. But what did you do? You turned it into a capital gains situation where God was actually ignored in all this. His wondrous works were totally overlooked. You see, what God was saying, I want you to respect me. I want you to have faith in me. I want you to have trust in me. The year of release. If thy brother, a Hebrew man or a Hebrew woman, be sold unto thee and serve thee six year, years, then in the seventh year thou shalt let him go free. The year of release. And when thou sendest him away, when thou sendest him out free from thee, Thou shalt not let him go away empty. Thou shalt furnish him liberally. You're going to show him compassion. You will furnish him liberally out of thy flock and out of thy floor and out of thy wine, wine press. Of that wherewith who? Yahweh thy God has blessed thee and thou shalt give unto him. You see, the whole thing about this, everything about the Sabbath, every single thing about year of relief, the Feast of Tabernacles, everything was about the fact that we have to build a character that is acceptable to God. Because once we have digressed from God's power, digressed from His Word, and moved into a situation where every man is doing that which is right in his own eyes, we have a situation where we start corrupting God's law, even down to the basic fundamentals of ignoring his Sabbath with regards to letting the land rest. You know, look at the words of Isaiah. This pretty much sums it up. It says, and your ancient ruins shall be rebuilt and shall raise up the foundations of many generations. Ye shall be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of streets to dwell in. If. It's always an if, isn't it? Two-letter word, very big meaning. If you turn back your foot from the Sabbath, from doing your pleasure on my holy day and call the Sabbath a delight. Stop doing things your way. Start doing things my way, saith Yahweh. And he carries on. And the holy day of, the, of Yahweh, honorable. If you honor it, not doing your own ways. How many times have we heard that? How many times through scripture does it say that he sent them out, his prophets, rising early, saying them, repent. It is not within Yahweh's character to destroy you. He's a loving God. We've only just read recently the situation where Jeremiah goes to Judah and he says to the last of the tribes in Judah, he says, Yahweh's bringing a nation against you. But if you don't go to Egypt, I will protect you and you can stay in your own land. But if you go to Egypt, if you go back to that place 
with all the abominations that I took you out of, that I delivered you, you shall surely die and you will die by the sword. What did they say? You're lying. And they go to Egypt. And they say, you know, since we've been worshipping Yahweh and not the Queen of Heaven and offering cakes unto her, everything's gone wrong. Well, really? That's because you've turned from my ways. Or seeking your own pleasure or talking idly. Then you shall take delight in Yahweh. That's a reciprocating word. It's not just the fact that you're going to take delight in Yahweh. He's going to take delight in you. Why? Because the mouth of Yahweh has spoken. You couldn't put a more sure stamp of verification and guarantee on that that it will be 100% guaranteed. That's the interesting thing about human nature. We have this assurance in God's word that that is what he requires of us and that is what we will get. And yet, we fall short. You know, when we think about where the building actually started, where did the building start? Like I say, we instinctively will shoot straight away. Ah, Ezra, the altar. Oh, Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel and Yeshua with the temple, with Haggai and Zechariah, the prophets, spurring him on. Or maybe, yes, Ezra reading the law and Nehemiah with the temple and uh, with the walls of Jerusalem. But they actually started long before that. You see, when the Shekinah glory was in, in, in Jerusalem, when it was over the temple, the most holy place, what did you have? You had the glory of God's presence there. But when that Shekinah glory left, why did it leave? Was it because the temple was corrupt? Or was it because... The people were corrupt. When did you ever hear in scripture, brethren, where it says, and sisters, where it says, the prophet comes and says, this temple is corrupt. It's always, turn your ways. You see, that is why the Sabbath, the land, the, the year of rest for the land was so important. It was a principle. It was something that Yahweh was trying to teach his people that they had to apply in their life. Look what it says in Acts chapter 7, verse 47. But Solomon built him an house. Howbeit the most high dwelleth not in temples made with hands, as saith the prophet. Heaven is my throne, and the earth is my footstool. What house would he build me, saith Yahweh? Or what is the place of my rest? And he continues on, on that in that particular part. And he says, the heavens of heavens can't contain you. How much less this house that I've built. And in 1 Corinthians, it tells us, What? Know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit which is in you? Which ye have of God? And ye are not your own. And lastly, in Isaiah 57, For thus saith the high and lofty one, that inhabiteth eternity, eternity, whose name is holy, I dwell in the high and lofty place with him also. Here it comes. That is of a contrite and a humble spirit. To revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. See, rebuilding, brothers and sisters, starts here with us. Way before the bricks and the mortar, 
That's what God is telling us. And that's what he told the children of Israel. He told them, you've absolutely, totally ignored my Sabbath of rest. And while you're out there, while you're out in another nation, while you're there thinking about what you had, thinking about the blessings that God gave you, thinking about the absolute bondage that you're under, thinking about all the beauties that you cast aside, thinking about how you absolutely ignored God, how you turned on His ways, how you broke His commandments, how you never fulfilled His statutes. You're going to be thinking about that. And it's only the strong that will survive. You want to know why? Because when the Assyrians and the Babylonians took exiles, they had a very shrewd method of taking the exiles. Smaller tribes, they kept together. Bigger tribes, they dispersed them. You know why? One, it's easier to keep track of them. Two, it's very easy to understand if there's insurrection and rebellion in a brewing. And three, they lose their identity. They lose their identity and they blend in with the world. So it's only those who are thinking about it, who are repentant and forsaked and thought about what they had left behind and prayed for God to redeem them are the ones that God will revive their spirit. You think I'm stretching it? Look at what Hebrews chapter 12 says. Now no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous but grievous nevertheless afterward it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them that are exercised thereby wherefore wherefore lift up the hands which hang down and the feeble knees is that us Do we yield peaceable fruit of righteousness when we are chastened? Do we? Do we lift up the hands that have fallen down? Do we pray for those who are in desperate need just like Daniel did? And you've got to remember there was a big difference between Daniel and between Ezekiel. Daniel was in the king's court. He had quite a good laugh. But he knew his brethren were suffering. And he prayed for them. Do we lift the hands that hang down? And the feeble knees? And do we make straight paths for our feet? So, that's what it means, that which is lame be not turned out of the way. So, do we lift the hands so they don't be turned out the way and encourage to be healed? And why does this all happen? Because Yahweh is a God full of compassion and gracious and patient. Something as humans, we do not have. More so in this time and age. Want a car? Yes. But I've got no money. Don't worry about it. Buy it now, never pay. Everything is now, now, now. This is pretty much summed up in Jeremiah 46. But thou... But fear not thou, O my servant Jacob, and be not dismayed, O Israel, for I will save thee from afar off, and thy seed from the land of their captivity. And Jacob shall return, and be in rest, and at ease, and none shall make him afraid. Fear thou not, O Jacob, my servant, saith Yahweh, I am with thee. 
You would never think that if you read Jeremiah in the first quote that we looked at, would you? But that's the mercy of God. For I will make a full end of nations, whether I have driven thee. Isn't that what happened to Babylon? But I will not make a full end of thee. However, it's the word but, I will correct thee in measure, and I will not leave thee wholly unpunished. Need to put that there. It's reciprocated. It's not something that is one-sided. So we come to this time when a decree goes forth, remember, Cyrus, king of Persia, who would have seen his name mentioned in Isaiah, if you were showed by Daniel, and in Jeremiah, and he makes a decree. Thus saith Sarath, king of Persia, Yahweh God of heaven hath given me all the kingdoms of the, of the earth, and he has charged me to build him a house at Jerusalem. You know, you, it's very difficult to comprehend the people that were there at that time, how they must have felt. Those that were reading and those that were praying to God and asking for his deliverance. And he, their prayers must have risen up to him as a sweet smelling savour. You know, this psalm doesn't speak of that time. But you can see the echo. When Yahweh turned again the captivity of Zion, we were like people that dream. Then was our mouth filled with laughter and our tongue with singing. And that's when the king, King Cyrus, says to those inhabitants at the time, Who is there among you of all his people? His God be with him and let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and build the house of Yahweh, God of Israel. He is the God. Have you heard that before? He is the God. I tell you, Daniel chapter 6. When was that? Daniel had just been taken out of the lion's den. He's just been taken out of the lion's den. And Darius comes and he sticks his, opens up and he says, Art thou there, O great Daniel? And he makes a decree that all people, nations and languages that dwell in all the earth, peace be multiplied unto you. I make a decree. That in every dominion of my kingdom, men shall tremble and fear. Hear that word again. They've got to reverence God. Before the God of Daniel. For he is the living God. And steadfast forever. And his kingdom, that which shall not be destroyed. And his dominion shall be even unto the end. He delivereth. And rescueth, and he del and worketh great signs and wonders in the earth. Tell me, why was he there in the first place? He was there in the first place, brothers and sisters, because he was not prepared to bow to the idols of Babylon. Not in the last slightest. He was not prepared to compromise in the very in at all. He was there because he had the character. He was steadfast forever. He reflected God's character. He manifested God's name. And that is why God said, You are greatly beloved. Isn't it amazing? Then, the excitement. Then rose up the chief of the fathers of Judah and Benjamin and the priests and the Levites, all whose spirit God had raised to go up and build the house. 
You see, they'd gone through this period now. They were taken from there in their arrogance, in their attitude, in their rebellion against God. They were put in there and they learnt just what they had. You know something? You only miss something after you've lost it. Eh? And they were stuck there and God molded their character. But they were still two classes of people here. Two classes of people. There were those whose spirit God had raised to go up to build the house of Yahweh, which is Jerusalem, and all they that were about them strengthened their hands with vessels of silver and gold. You see, that's what Isaiah said. Isaiah said, those who are humble, those who are contrite, I will raise their spirit. I will build them up. I will build their character. I will mold them. I will make them vessels that are prepared to serve me. Then rose the chief of the fathers of Judah and Benjamin. That's interesting. That words about them is the words neighbours. What was so special about them? Well, I'll tell you what was so special about them. They had amalgamated into the surroundings. They were comfortable there. This wasn't like the likes of Mordecai or like the likes of Nehemiah. Different time frame, different conditions. This was an opportunity that was offered to all. You got a free reign to go. And I will give you whatever you need to go build a house of the God of heaven. He is the God. But there were those that were about them. Well, now we're pretty comfortable where we are. My nice new flesh home. Got a good job. I only have to walk down the road to go get my veggies. What am I going to do? I've got to go on this long journey. I don't know what's waiting for me there. I'm going to have to work and slave. There could be robbers on the way. Who's going to run my business while I'm away? No, I'll stay here. I'll be an armchair brother. And what I'll do is I'll give them some money. I don't want to get my hands dirty with the work. That's their job. About them. You see, there were two classes. There and there. And there are two separate parts of the spectrum. One group had had a character built up and they were now returning to a land that had gone through its Sabbath, that had gone through its healing process, that had now been through a situation where it was cleansed and now they were going to have a population of people that will be coming back there who qualified to take up the role of inhabiting that land. You know, that's been the story from the beginning, isn't it? When you think about it, for the Lord Jesus Christ, who was it that put him to death? The chief priests and, and, uh, and the princes of the land. When you think of it of Jeremiah's time, who were the ones that actually chased him? The chief priests, the false prophets, and the princes. And so it is that that land that's actually gone through that situation is going to be healed. God says, I am calling out a people for my name in the age to come. When the saints who are going through their time of probation 
as we are. When we are having our characters molded, getting ready for that time, are we going to take over a world full of the corruption of man? No, first step is us, brothers and sisters. First step is us. Then we rebuild. Then we rebuild. You see, when you look at what it says in Isaiah, strengthen ye the weak hands and confirm the feeble knees. Say to them that are of fearful heart, be strong, fear not. And the ransomed of Yahweh shall return and come to Zion with songs and everlasting joy upon their heads. You know what's interesting about that trip? Is that the exiles took the exact route that Abraham did. The exact route. They left and that's where they ended up. Where, what, where was uh, Abraham? Abraham originally earth Chaldeas. See what the lesson is here. By following the same general path that Abraham first trod, the point is being emphasized that the returning exiles could have no real hope unless they became like their father Abraham in every respect. And what was that? Abraham believed God. He trusted God and was accounted to him for righteousness. So where's our heart? Is it there? Or is it there? Just an intermediate question. You see, the interesting thing is, is that Shazbaza, the prince, isn't that bizarre? Shazbaza, his name means rejoicing in distress. And who was going with him? Yeshua the priest. Yah shall save. They were leading the people back to the land. Ring a bell? What's going to happen in the future? He was also a governor. Then came Shazbaza. This is just as an aside. I believe Shazbaza and Zerubbabel are the same person. And I'll tell you why. Because in Ezra chapter 5 and verse 16, Then came Shazbaza and laid the foundation of the house of God which is in Jerusalem. And since that time, even until now, hath it been in building and is not yet finished. But in Zechariah chapter 4, which is contemporary with Ezra, The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this house. His hands also has finished it, and they shall know that Yahweh of armies hath sent you. And so it is. That they get into the land. And on the seventh month, children of Israel were in the cities. And they came together as one man. See, that's the difference. They separated just like Abraham did. They came to the city. Those that were the others didn't come into their mind because they were one unit. It's called ecclesial love. That's what it's supposed to be. As one man. As opposed to about them. Then stood up Yeshua, the son of Josedek, and his brethren, the priest, and Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and his brethren, and built the altar of the God of Israel to do, to burn offerings unto Yahweh. As it is written in the law of Moses, the man of God. And they set the altar in the exact place that's what it's that's what it means there they set the altar upon his basis and why is that for fear was on them that word fear is the word terror 
an overwhelming feeling of fear and anxiety. That's how they felt towards the people that were there. They had no protection. Hold on. What happened to the faith in God? What they were doing was, by representation, they were actually setting up the altar to make sacrificial offering to associate themselves with God. And they kept also the Feast of Tabernacles as it is written and offered the daily burnt offerings by number. According to the custom, as the duty of every day required. And when was that? In the seventh month. But one thing was missing. The atonement. Because they couldn't do that. Because the temple wasn't built. And it was no holy and most holy. And it was only by the high priest going once a year on his own into the most holy to offer an offering of atonement for the people. They knew they had one shot at it. To show God that they put him as a priority. And that if it was so and God heard their pleas that he would protect them from the people of the land. You see, God's blessing rests upon those who diligently set out to do his work. Rests upon those who set out diligently to do his work. I want to highlight that. That's how important it is. Now I'll just skip through these last, these few ones, because I just want to show you that they should have known this. That there was no coincidence. There is no coincidence in God's word. See how many times the word seventh occurs. Ezra chapter 7 in the seventh year of Artaxerxes. Ezra chapter 7 again. According to the good hand of his God upon him. Ezra chapter 7. Nehemiah chapter 7. The seventh main month came and the children of Israel were in their cities. Nehemiah chapter 8. Upon the first day of the seventh month. Nehemiah chapter 8, that they should dwell in booths in a feast of the seventh month. Nehemiah chapter 10, and that would leave the seventh month and the, and the exact of every debt, the year of release. And Esther chapter 2, Esther becomes queen in the seventh year of Ahasuerus. But as with love, there's always choices. Because almost like a lightning bolt, once again, flashing through the sky, you've got this random part that sits straight off to verse 6. Because verse 6 says, From the first day of the seventh month began they to offer burnt offerings unto Yahweh. And then comes this, But the foundation of the temple of the Lord of Yahweh was not laid. And then we have to ask the question, why is it? And the next verse gives us a little bit of an indication. Well, they gave money also to masons and to carpenters and uh, meat and drink and oil unto them of Zidon and to them of Tyre to bring cedar trees from Lebanon to the Sea of Joppa. So, they got from Tyre and they went all the way from Tyre down to Joppa. And then from Joppa, they went across the land along to Jerusalem. But there's an association here yeah, because that's a BC 535. You got Tyre. And what did they supply? The trees. And you got the masons. And what did the masons do? The masons did the stonework. So, why is it 
that while they were waiting for the word, that no work was done. Well, it's one of two things. There's the possibility that the foundation was not laid because Solomon did it in the second month and they were maybe trying to comply with that. But you see, I believe that the seed of complacency was already starting to seep in. Because I told you earlier on, besides the atonement, there was one other thing that they had missed. And that was in the Feast of Tabernacles. You see, because in Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 17, it says, All the congregation of them that will come again out of the captivity made booths and sat under the booths. For since the days of Jeshua, the son of Nun, within the time of Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, unto that day had not the children of Israel done so. So when they did that, when they offered on the sacrifice on the altar, they didn't do it. So what they were doing is not doing things completely to the law. Very interesting. How easy the mind can overlook that. And if you see that it was in the second year of their coming unto the house of God at Jerusalem, in the second month began Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Jeshua, the son of Jesedek, and a remnant of their brethren, the priests and the Levites, and they come out that will come out of captivity unto Jerusalem and pointed unto the Levites from 20 years old and upward to set forth the work of the house of Yahweh. And that was the exact time too that Solomon built his house. There's one danger there. I believe it was convenient. Because they would have known 586 to 535. You don't have to be finished by 516. You got plenty of time. We can go build our houses. You'll see that's exactly what Haggai says. The work of the truth was put on hold. Yet, that could so easily apply to us. We have the prophecies of at Christ's return. We know Christ, the very return of Christ is at the door. But we think instinctively, it won't happen in our time. I don't have to worry about it. I'll be dead. Maybe you will. Because how do you know that one hour from now, any of us could be alive. And the prophet says that while you have life, worship and honor God. While there is breath in your lungs, that's when you've got to worship and honor God. And so it was that they all sung together by course in praising and giving thanks unto Yahweh because he is good and his mercy endureth forever towards Israel. And all the people shouted with a great shout. And they praised Yahweh because the foundation of the house of Yahweh was laid. You know, Yeshua, Yah shall save, was there. You think that the very fact that that person, that, high, that priest, was instrumental in the names, you think it would have spurred them on, kicked them into life? Just look at this. And many of the priests and Levites and chiefs of the fathers who were ancient men that had seen the first house when the foundation of this ancient, of this house was laid before the eyes wept with a loud voice and many shouted for joy. Why wept? What's the reason? Well, I'll tell you what it is. It's called selective memory. Because isn't that human nature? Isn't it what we remember? The good times. It's like you create your life, brothers and sisters. You'll always be an opportunity 
for us to complain about something that's been done or not been done properly. Just take a look at it. When it talks about the fish and the cucumbers and the melons and the leeks and the onions and the garlic. And then, of course, there is nothing but this manna before our eyes. Who gave them those leeks? It was the Egyptians. Did they earn it? Of course they did. They were under bondage for it and they had to work like slaves to get that. It wasn't handed out to them. Who gave them the manna? Who gave them the manna that in the same process like the day of Sabbath, that he would give them six days? On the sixth day was the only day that the manna didn't Go rotten. The sixth day, you had a double portion and it lasted for the duration of the seventh day. God gave it to them. So when they soon run and they say, this manna before our eyes, who are they ridiculing? Yahweh. And that is human nature. But here's the scary part. It's not God's nature. So all the people could not discern the noise of the shout of joy from the noise of the weeping of the people. For the people shouted with a loud voice and the noise was heard afar off. I just want to quickly shoot through this psalm. This psalm was done. It was David's first psalm. It's in 1 Chronicles chapter 16. When David brings the Ark of the Covenant into Jerusalem and he's ecstatic that the glory of God again is once in their midst and he offers a prayer, a psalm of glory and thanks to God. And it's the bullet points that I've put there is what they would have been thinking about when they said, for his mercy endureth forever. Because that is what they cited. Was the psalm of David when he brought the covenant. The ark of the covenant. Just take a look there. Seek Yahweh. Seek his strength. Remember his marvelous works. His wonders. Be mindful always of his covenant. And what covenant is that? Even the covenant which he made with Abraham. The same journey that they took out. The next one, he reproveth kings for their sakes. Why? Because don't touch my anointed. Can you see where their thoughts are going with standing up the altar? Declares glory among the nation, his marvelous works amongst all the nations. Give glory and honor to his strength. Fear Yahweh. Yahweh reigneth. He will judge the earth. He will judge the nations. His mercy endureth forever. Save us, O God of our salvation. Deliver us from the nations. But the foundation of the temple was not yet laid. So we come to our last quote which is the, the reading we read this evening in Haggai chapter 1. And Haggai comes and he says, Thus saith Yahweh of armies. It's interesting how Yahweh surveyeth is used when there is a time that God is expecting you to sit up, open your ears and take notice of what he's saying. Thus saith Yahweh of armies. This people say, the time is not come. The time is that the Yahweh's house should be built is not come. Then came the word of Yahweh by Haggai the prophet saying, and that was at 5.20. 520. That's 15 years later. And they're saying, the time is not come yet. They were too busy. 
And that is why when God, Haggai, brings in the next verse, he says, Is it time for you, O ye, to dwell in your sealed houses and this house lie waste? Know that word time is? Fascinating word. It actually means suitable, convenient. Saying, it's convenient for you to live in your houses, get all your fancy stuff, build up your own earthly treasures. 20 years later, my house is still lying waste. Who saved you in the first place? What are you doing? Now therefore, thus saith Yahweh Sabbath, consider your ways. And he gives a warning to them. And he says, you have so much and bring in little. You eat, but you have not enough. Ye drink, but ye are not filled with drink. Ye clothe you, but there is none warm. And he that earneth wages, earneth wages to put into a bag with holes. 2017? My father always used to say that his salary was like standing on a station and watching a train coming. He could see it coming forever, but it was only in front of him for a few seconds. Thus saith Yahweh of armies, he repeats it, Consider your ways. Go to the mountain. Bring wood and build a house and I will take pleasure in it and I will be glorified, saith Yahweh. That word take pleasure, once again reciprocating. Not only is he going to take pleasure in it, but he's going to take pleasure in the people that are doing it. Here's that phrase again. God's blessing rests upon those who set out diligently to do his work. So, brothers and sisters, where is our heart? There? Or there? And just like them, Zerubbabel, Yeshua, or Shazbeza, and all the people that were round about at the time. And when they shouted with a loud shout, their voices and the noise was heard from afar off. They were about to receive their very first major challenge. Their faith was about to be tested. A full test of their faith. Whether their moulding, whether their character building had been successful. Whether they were true to their calling. Whether they were prepared to have faith in God. Whether they were prepared to respect God and reverence His most holy name. And be thankful for Him taking them out and bringing them into the year of release. They were about to be tested. Would they be successful? They're going to find out very soon. But you will have to wait for next week. <laughs>